Hey crew, it's Pitt and I'm back with some more Esoterica. Today we are diving back into the works of Hiram Butler. This is the goal of life. We are reading aloud and discussing as we go along the various points of interest that are brought to light by the text. It is not the format for everyone, but some people seem to find enjoyment in it, so you are more than welcome to tag along. Before we begin, however, I'm going to refer you back, or if you are unfamiliar with me, any of my unconventional beliefs, or if at any point in time I lose you in the terminology, there are several playlists linked in the corner above and in the box down below along with the original source material so that you can get a better understanding of exactly how I got here. A particular note, again, it's going to be the unconventional Bible study, 161 videos where I walk through the deconstruction of myself and Christianity. I believe in God, absolutely. The Son, not so much. That is detailed here, and it is almost certainly going to be relevant. I will point it out again, I am sure. With all that being said, we are going to dive in and continue our exploration of the goal of life by Hiram Butler. This is chapter 16, The Image of God. <clears throat> we read in Genesis 1:27 that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. If we are to consider the image of God in man as a physical expression or form of man, then we must consider the creative form as manifested in nature. As we have stated in the former chapter, that all nature is his body and God the soul of all, it is evident that we have before us a vast field of thought. In the childhood of our race, we were satisfied to believe that as man was made in the image of God, God must be in the image of man. While this statement is in itself correct, yet it comes far short of the great truth involved, that the early church was caused to draw a sharp distinction between what is called the work of God and the work of nature. It is a sad commentary on the advancement of our race that even now we hear professed scientists say that God has nothing to do with some great convulsion of nature, because it can be traced to some natural cause. It is just as the, at this point that infidelity is growing most rank. But when we accept the fact that God is the soul and creative power, active in all that is, we have laid a foundation for reasonable, orderly thought. Starting, then, from this, the fundamental truth to search for the image of man in the great universal whole, we are led back to a line of thought that, because of the prevailing materialism and ignorance, has been for the last century in great disrepute. We refer to the recognition of the influence of the heavenly bodies over our earth and over man. Sometime in the long forgotten past, someone discovered what the Greeks denominated the circle of animals the zodiac. The term circle of animals, although displaying a partial ignorance of the real nature of the thing named, yet indicates a great truth, a truth discerned by seers and sages of all past ages down to our own time. Notably, among those whose names stand among whose names stand those of Plato and Swedenborg, who saw what they called the grand man of the heavens. In 1887, the author of the present volume published a work entitled Solar Biology. A special object of this work is to delineate character from the date of birth of a person. In this work, it is proved, as accurately as any scientific fact can be proved, that a person is dominated and characterized by that function of the human body represented by the particular sign of the zodiac in which the earth was at its time of his birth. The Apostle Paul seemed to have a conception of this fact when he said, The body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one of body, for the body, is not one member, but many. If a foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, it is not therefore not of the body. And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, it is not therefore not of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, each of them in the body, even as it pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now they are many members, but one body. 
and whether one member suffereth, all the members suffer with it, or one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members each in his part. <clears throat> First Corinthians eleven twelve through 27 To make a statement of the fact, without attempting to prove its ver verity, let us assume that surrounding our sun there is what may be called twelve oceans of etheric life, separated one from another by well-defined lines and that these twelve oceans contain qualities represented by the twelve functions of the human organism, beginning with Aries, the head of the grand man, followed by Taurus, the neck, Gemini, the hands and arms, Cancer, the breast, Leo, the heart, Virgo, the stomach and digestive system, Libra, the reins, and so on through the twelve functions of the human organism. Through these twelve oceans, all the planets of the solar system pass in their voyage around their parent sun. A planet and the particular ocean in which it is immersed reciprocally contribute their qualities. The ocean of life receives from the planet and the planet in turn from the ocean of life, its people being dominated by the qualities of that ocean. With the aid of solar biology, anyone can prove these statements to be facts. The sun, the planets, may have influence on things, but it does not determine absolutely anything about who you are and what you are. I am a Gemini. I know many Geminis, and none of us are exactly the same. None of us are even, like, many of us are astoundingly different. If we were indeed guided by this, like, I know people who were born the same day I was, like, literally separated by distance not even that far apart. We would have the same azimuth and all of that stuff. It doesn't play as big of a part as you would think. What does, however, is the MPTI system that I have reworked into something working. It has a lot to do with how you process information and how you give it back. It, it determines in large part who you are, how you go about life. There are tendencies that you will find in the MBTI system that are not included in the Zodiac. I am not a believer in the Zodiac, not in the way that it is interpreted. There are absolutely influences from outside of this particular planet. I don't doubt that. The moon causes tides. There is other magnetic perturbations that happen due to the things in the sky. But it does not determine, like, you're going to be duplicitous or you're going to be uh, courageous or a leader or, like, those things are not, they, they don't have nothing to do with your zodiac. And if you think that they do, I'm sorry I'm stepping on your toes, but I am most definitely stepping on your toes. We find around our Earth there is also a zodiac whose influence governs the physical body and its senses. This zodiac is separate from the zodiac of the sun and in its exact image, with the single exception that the order of the Earth's zodiac is a reversal of the sun's zodiac. For illustration, when the Earth is on the side of the sun represented by the sign Aries, and the moon is on a line with the sun and the Earth, it is new in the sign Aries of the Earth's zodiac thus showing that in relation to each other, the two zodiacs are in reversed order. Again, the earth being in the sign Aries, the moon is full, that is, it is on the line with the sun and the earth, and on the side of the earth opposite of the sun, when it is in the sign Libra. See accompanying diagram, that is, this one. We particularize in regard to this matter because it is an important truth in psychology that this reversal is indicated in the fact that every truth received by the individual through the senses is reversed to the mind. That is not a fact. <laughs> Mirroring is a thing. Inversion is a thing, but it is not a guaranteed thing, right? It is not an important truth that this reversal is indicated that every truth received is uh, through the senses is reversed to the mind. That is not true. That is that is patently untrue. This accounts for the great perversion of truth. No one can realize to what extent truth is perverted until he is developed to a point where the spiritual consciousness begins to dominate the personality. Now you do 
color the things that you learn. There are people living right now here today who have alternative facts, right? I'm not going to bring it to the political realm. I'm trying not to do that, but there are left and right, and one side actually deals in facts and the other side deals in the inversion of facts. That is through coloring through their beliefs what is in actuality. This thing actually happened. The interpretation of it can be skewed by the color that you see it through, right? Whatever shade you put in your glasses that you are looking at. <clears throat> We have diverged, however, from the direct line of our thought, though perhaps necessarily. We have brought to your mind a picture of the grand man in the heavens, in the position of the fetus in the womb, with head and feet together surrounding the sun and another surrounding the earth. And we have also hinted at the fact that in the movements of these heavenly bodies, creation is carried on, that each of the various members of the human family, created at the different periods of the year, is the embodiment of a specific function of the grand man of the heavens. Again, patently untrue. But each of these persons is also the embodiment of the qualities of the entire zodiac. That's closer to the truth. Or has these qualities represented in his organism. He is dominated, however, by the quality of that particular function in which he was born. For as we have seen, each of the twelve oceans represents one of the twelve functions that constitute the human organism. That is logical, logically inconsistent, but as, therefore, the heavenly bodies are the mind organs of the infinite, engaged in the work of creation by means of their constant revolution around their center, and as man is the product of those creative energies, being in the exact image of the zodiac, it is evident that, in the words of the scriptures, God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him. That has nothing to do with the previous part of the paragraph. This fact gave rise to the following poem by a modern poet. Twelve angels rule the planetary screen scheme. Each hath an orb, one deity supreme. In their indwelling life they bow the knee to one God-man who rules immensity. Twelve angel nymphs in the air, earth, sea, and fire dwell with a viewless and unnumbered choir rolling the elements twelve oceans roll their light waves from the one creative soul twelve archetypal spheres roll time and space twelve primal splendors shine down from god's own face the number twelve is not the correct one i know we're going to step on toes but it is 32. the organized image we have been considering the expression of the creative image in its material and earth mind manifestation. A manifestation which had its beginning when man was formed, but the image in its expression by no means stops here. This is but its beginnings. In order that there may be an organism capable of expressing divinity, there must be an aggregation of such individual bodies. <clears throat> As the apostle has stated in the foregoing quotation, there must be a the bringing together of a body of people who have whose minds have sufficiently developed to realize something of their source and to desire and to desire to come into perfect unison oneness with the mind and will that form them that is true that it's it's unrelated to the zodiac but that is true right there are people who think in different manners and they need to come together to think in unison right but it is only the people who have sufficiently developed to realize something of their source that even have the capacity to do so. If you are searching, then you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. But if you're not looking and you're not knocking, the door will remain closed. Man, as we find him at the beginning of this 20th century, has his whole interest, desire, and thought centered upon self, me and mine. Thus, he is held as a part separated from the grand body, the body of humanity. As the animal world, he is struggling with his fellows, fighting for his own supremacy. Consequently, labor, sorrow, and death appear on every side, arising from the same cause which produces disease in the individual body. Namely, every organ is out of harmony with the body general. 
That's not true. Labor, sorrow, and death are part of life. They are not a byproduct. They are not the consequence. They are simply part of. You are meant to labor. You are meant to lose things and no sorrow. Death is meant to be. These are not a disease. They are not something afflicting you. They are simply part of life. They are something that you are to learn from, to strive to overcome in cases. But it is not a disease. It's not. And that is a victim mentality mindset. Therefore, the whole body of humanity is diseased from the crown of the head to the soles of the feet. Every organ and function warring against the other members and against the fountains of immortality, the source of being. Thus, death reigns supreme and will so reign until the formation of the body of the Christ, vaguely referred to in the quotation from Paul. Each individual is not in himself an organ or function of the body of humanity. Wrong. Patently untrue. You are indeed an organ in the function of the body of humanity. That is, that is another absolute truth. And I don't stand, like, I don't declare absolute truths often. That is a real thing, right? You are a part of humanity. <laughs> Were this true, the race would be con constituted of but 12 individuals. No, again, you have the wrong number. On the contrary, each individual is but a molecule in the grand body. And each of these molecules finds its place in its own function. Now you're arguing with semantics. And thus the body is formed of a multitude of members. You're just arguing scale at this point, right? Oh, you're not an organ, you're just a cell. Okay, whatever, it's the same difference. It really is. Now, you are not the entirety of the body of, of humanity, but you are a piece of the body. Just as I, I use the fingernail all of the time because it is a mostly useless piece of information. Like, it protects the quick and it is a useful tool for the things in which it was designed. But for the most part, we don't really use it, right? We don't have talons and claws like animals. We have fingernails. And so I say that you are a piece of the fingernail in the, in the hand of God. You are part of God. That is an absolute truth. But you are not God. You're just a piece of the fingernail that is part of God. You are the individualized sliver of divinity that makes the meat suit move. That is who you are. You are a part of humanity. And okay, you're not an organ, you're a cell. That's just semantics. The body is made from a multitude of members, however, that is true. All living bodies are composed of an aggregation of molecules each a living organism with a separate yet united consciousness. That is also true, but governed by a common law of attraction. Again, true, which causes it to unite, become one with the general body. Now, the body of the individual man constructed of these molecules becomes, in turn, a molecule in a greater and grander aggregation, which is called in Revelation the body of the Christ. The question arises here. How can there be an aggregation of men and women so united as to constitute one body, a united whole? Such a condition would certainly be a normal one in the view of the constitution of the race, but a survey of the plane next beyond us answers the questions more fully. The indications to which we refer, active upon the plane next beyond the masses, are these. Here and there, scattered through the world, are men and women who have reached a degree of sensitiveness, that enables them to feel the mental state of a person as soon as they come into contact with him. That's me. And immediately there arises within them a feeling either of attraction or repulsion. Again, me. A loving sympathy or a painful impression of something poisonous to their nature. This is but the beginning of an, an anticipating of a plane of existence which must necessarily obtain in the order of progressive unfoldment and refinement of the race. Okay, we're going to stop for a second. We're going to talk. There are energetic centers within you. There are seven internal and one external for a total of eight. They are listed here. Base, which is around your butthole. The sacral, which is around your reproductive areas. The solar plexus, which is your gut, your stomach. Your heart, which is what binds the lower with the upper. 
the throat, which is where you express your desires, the third eye, where you see those desires, the crown, where you receive instruction from the divine. And finally, the divine, which is the eighth one. It is external to you, but it is also intricately part of you. All of these are magnetic. They all have magnetism. They are separate, but they interact. The interaction thereof can be discerned. You have the ability to do that. I don't care who you are, and where you are, or what you are. You have, at one point in time, had a gut feeling, an attraction even. If you walk into a room and you see somebody and you're like, this is a bad situation. I don't feel like being here. That is a gut feeling, right? That is your gut interacting with your base, letting you know this is probably not the place for you. It is a magnetic interaction. Your aura is interacting with their aura and you are reading those intentions without even knowing it. And your body is reacting to it and you feel an aversion to that person. The same can be said if you walk into the same room and you see somebody who is extremely attractive and you're like, wow, it doesn't have to be sexual, right? You're like, wow, I am impressed by this person without ever speaking to them. That is your gut, once again, giving you something to do. Now, this can go a couple of ways. If it is a strong sexual attraction, it is probably a gut reacting with your sacral. If it is a strong attraction outside of sexuality, it is possible that it is a gut interacting with your heart. Your gut can interact with your throat. Your throat can interact with your crown. These things all interact with each other to give you different levels of intuition. It is an early warning device. That's what he's describing here. He doesn't understand that. But I do. I know the mechanics behind it. I have talked about it in other videos. I'm not sure which ones, but there are several other videos where we discuss this in less detail than we're doing right here. This interaction is a magnetic response. It is a direct reading of their energy. That is available to everyone, but not everyone has the sensitiveness to understand that. They don't, they're not able to read it. Some of us, we call ourselves empaths. We can read that energy effortlessly, effortlessly. I believe that part of that has to do with the MBTI system, which I have redone. It has to do with the feeling part of that. It is less to do with the thinking part of that. That is a sliding scale. If you are farther over to the feeling part, then you are probably more empathic that allows you to read those magnetics in a way that those who are farther towards the thinking end don't allow to happen. It's not that they don't have it, they just don't allow it to impress them. That is the fairly significant difference, but it is the only difference. It is you allowing it to happen, which makes it happen. There's nobody who is special, right? I call myself an empath. I can literally take energy from people and refine it. I can take energy from people and ground it. I can give other people my energy and completely change their mood. These are things I have done. And so when I speak on those with authority, I mean it. It's because I have some authority there. When I describe these things to you, it is because I have some authority there. I am telling you that this is possible. You can do it. As far as I am aware, I don't have anything special about me other than dedication. I pray fast and meditate and I work with the energies. I have learned how to do that. I believe that you can too. I don't believe that it is special to me. I am not some special person. I am merely one of the vessels using the powers that were given to all of the vessels. But a lot of you will never use it and so it will be forever to you as something that does not exist. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means that you won't allow it to take part in your life. That is a significant difference. You get free will. You get to choose things. This is one of the things you get to choose. <clears throat> All right, back. This is but the beginning of anticipating of a plane of existence which must necessarily obtain in the order of progressive unfoldment and refinement of the race. Earth's 
greatest teacher, used the vine as a symbol of the formation of his this body. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. If a man abide not in me, he cast forth as a branch, and is withered. The apostle takes up the thought expressed in this quotation and speaks of the wild olive branch being grafted upon the fruitful tree. And God, through the prophet, uses like symbolism, not to multiply words, but that we may at once get the central thought. We ask you to bear this symbolism in mind. The methods of being grafted into the true vine are referred to by Christ in John 15.1. When men have been born from above and their soul powers are developed to where they begin to live from God as did the Lord Christ, their minds will be illuminated and they will see that the Spirit of God is one and that all who live from the Spirit of God must necessarily be one. That is true. The oneness is brought to light in Revelation chapters 1, 7, 14, 21, and 22. I think I got those right. That is true, right? We are all from the oneness. And part of the enlightenment experience, at least for me, was indeed this. I was taken out of my body during my enlightenment experience. And I was given a guided tour of the universe. I saw the formation and creation. I saw the plan begin to unfold. And I saw some of the interconnectedness of the plan. When that experience happened to me, I lost racism. Now, I don't talk about it as much as I probably could, but it's because I don't place the power in it that I did. I grew up in a racist household. I say it as the household I grew up in. Racism was not a stranger, but it is a stranger in the one that I grew and my kids grew up in. That is because of this experience directly. I was shown that it, God created everyone. Every single person everywhere is directly here from the express will of God for different reasons. And so, to me, to judge somebody based upon the color of the skin that God chose to give them is dumb. And it was this awakening experience that allowed me to embrace everyone as a fellow human being. It is also the thing that brought me away from Christianity. If you are un unaware of how that could possibly be, I refer you to the Bible study where we talk about whether or not there was a chosen people. In order to bring this thought more clearly to mind, let us picture 144,000 persons or 288 men and women because, you know, if the Bible was the divine express word of God, of course he would misspeak and not mention the other half of the 144,000 people. who have become so developed in soul consciousness that each individual feels the feelings of every other and of the body in toto, and not only feels but is vividly conscious of the thoughts of the individual members of the body and of the body in its entirety as he is of his own thoughts. Would not this be a condition that would virtually do away with the separate individuality of the members of the body? Would it not, we ask you to consider the question, constitute all the members of that body as perfectly one, as there are molecules that compose our own organism in their unity forming the individual man. It would most assuredly. Now, if this body of 144,000 members is to be constituted of the most highly developed men and women of our planet, we should naturally look for the greatest, grandest aggregation of mind that the world has ever known. Moreover, we must consider each and every member of that body as a living, the regenerate life, conserving and storing up within himself or herself all the vitality that is generated by the body through a normal sex action. Thus, not only increasing his normal capacities many, many fold, but through the, divine, the fires of the divine life active within him, transmuting, refining and intensifying the elements of his own body, increasing his sensitiveness, intensifying his sensibilities, and becoming more and more vividly conscious of his dependence on every other member of the body for the perfection of his own individual organism. That is again true, right? 
We are here to commingle, cohabit, and to help each other to rise. And it is impossible to refine yourself without something to refine yourself with. Other people help you to refine yourself. It is evident, therefore, that such a body of people would be so drawn together by common sympathy that each member would be satisfied and happy in the fact that he is able to be his own normal self, supplemented and complemented by the normal action of every other individual. Thus, in the light of absolute truth, disagreement or inharmony would be impossible in such a body. Now, this is the body brought to light in the 21st chapter of the Revelation. The only, the only way we are ever going to have no disharmony is in the after. We're not here for the after. We're here for the now. It is the very disharmony that causes us to be refined. It is the people we disagree with who help us to sharpen our beliefs, to understand why we hold them. It is through disagreement, like I am doing here, that you become more sure in what you know or are corrected in what you hold incorrectly. Disharmony is a function, not a flaw. But this is only the human side of it. The prophet, seeing the ultimation of this, the divine purpose, exclaims, Yahweh is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Habakkuk 2.20 And the apostle particularized the same thought when he said, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? That is true. This meat suit, the body that you were given to pilot around in the becoming, that is the temple of God, and you should be taking care of it. The Spirit, the part that is the becoming, that is there too. As we have had occasion to say in former chapters, and shall more fully elaborate in the chapters that are to follow, the methods of life which are to bring men and women to this ultimate all tend to the one central object of uniting their consciousness to God, their Heavenly Father. Herein is found the perfection of the symbolism chosen by the Lord Jesus, the symbol of the vine. <laughs> For, as spiritual beings, men come out from God, and to attain this ultimate they must return to God, return to a conscious oneness with their source, that... Right, Not the after, but here, conscious oneness that is attainable through prayer, fasting, and meditation and through no other form. They must live from God as literally as the vine lives from the earth, air, and sunlight. And as the same sap that nourishes the vine nourishes all its branches and its fruitage, so the body, as to the individual members, being united with the Christ, the true vine, and he with the with the Father, will be partakers of the same life, the same Spirit. The mind and will, Spirit, of God will be the mind of all the body in the same direct way that a common life unites all the molecules of our individual bodies. Let us now sum up the dominant thought of this work. This grand body has evolved from the lowest form of life to the most highly developed men and women of our planet, these have increased, refined, and intensified their faculties manyfold. Add to these highly developed mind qualities, the mind qualities, gained by a perfect unity with the whole body of mind. Illuminate such a body of mind by a perfect unity with the mind currents of Yahweh Elohim. And you have man with the dominion over the whole earth, the finished creation, the image of the God-man of the heavens, the image of of God. <clears throat> this is a brief summing up of the history of the journey of the soul from God and its return to God. Can you imagine the power of this body upon our planet? Do you wonder that in the revelation given to St. John it is said that they shall be kings and priests unto God and reign on the earth? This body will be the God of the planet, even as Elohim is the God of the solar system. <laughs> That's bordering on blasphemy. <laughs> Herein is the fulfillment of the purpose declared in the beginning, to make man in the divine image. For the image of Yahweh Elohim can be perfected upon the earth only through the organization, the fitting together of such a body. 
and constituting that body, Yahweh Elohim, or giving it a right to the name Yahweh, means that every individual member, member in his or her consciousness has united himself to the God of the universe in the same direct way that was the members of that eternal brotherhood that has existed in all worlds from all time, have united their lives with Yahweh, the God of all systems of worlds, and they are conscious in and of him. In other words, conscious that they are merely a mind center produced by Yahweh, through which he finds expression. The next step in the developing of our race and planet is to be the gathering and constructing of such a body as we have pictured, and this body will be but one mind organ of the infinite. But we are encroaching upon our chapter on the image and likeness, wherein this subject will be further discussed, and we're about to get there, right? The likeness of God, the office of the Christ. We will discuss very briefly the Zodiac doesn't have a whole lot to do with who you are, but you are here for the experience of being here. Some people take exception to the fact that God is beyond the ability to grieve. God is beyond the ability, really, for happiness because he already knew the outcome. Right? It is through us and our limited memory of being elsewhere that we are able to grow, and part of that growth is the human experience. To try to take away the experience as being unnecessary or a disease is minimizing the efforts of God to experience here. We are meant to be here. We are meant to be in accordance with each other and with God. God primarily, and if you are in accordance with God and I am in accordance with God, then we are in accordance with each other. You can be in accordance with each other without God, however. It is not advisable, but it is definitely something you can do. I am here literally trying to bring about this unity, right? I know it seems awfully disunion to talk about Christianity in the way that I do. I believe that Christ was trying to do away with the control system and that they created a control system out of him trying to do away with it. And so I am trying to do away with it. I believe that you are able to go to God with no intermediary ne necessary, right? You can go directly to God with whatever it is. I believe that God has invested in you the powers of creation. I have manifested those creation powers in my own life. I have healed myself in very real ways through the power of God, never get it twisted. But he allows you the use of the same things that he gave to me, it is not exclusive to me, but it does take dedication. It does take prayer, fasting, and meditation. You have to be committed to the path and willing to accept the correction that comes along with that. All right, we're going to jump into this next chapter. Chapter 16, 17, The Likeness of God, The Office of the Christ. <clears throat> it is so bad on my allergies today, y'all. Y'all don't even understand. The mystery of the ages is involved in the consummating of the purpose of God to make man in his image and likeness and the preparing of man to become an heir of God and joint heir with the Christ. In order to obtain a clear understanding of this subject, it becomes necessary to consider what is man, how man is brought into the divine likeness. In the effort to answer the question, what is man, it is necessary to consider the earth as it appears to our physical senses because it is a reality to all physical existence. We find that man is limited to his planet. <laughs> he lives from it, and without it he would immediately perish. Man cannot live without food, water, and air. We find, too, that if the brain is diseased, the man becomes insane, and the change is as radical as if he were another being. This is evidence that the materialistic mind that man has no life beyond animal life, and this is true in itself and is in accord with the teachings of Christ. For he said to those around him, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are from of this world, I am not of this world. And thus he drew a line of his distinction very clearly. Again, he said concerning his life and the life of men, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. 
thus emphatically implying that during the existence of the carnal man upon earth, he is subject to accident, disease, and death, so that he may pass out of the body at any time. In order to rise superior to such conditions, there must be something superadded, to which Jesus referred in the words, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have not life in yourself. And to those who objected, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? He explained by this eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood by saying, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Thus he did away with the thought that the bread, or wafer, and the wine are the actual flesh and blood of the Lord, and left us to the indubitable conclusion that the eating of the wafer and the drinking of the wine are simply symbolism a memorial to the fullness of times that when that which is symbolized will be realized. But the great point under consideration is the emphatic utterance, Ye have not life in yourselves. Has no man life in himself? Christ said in another place, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself implying that the Son did not have life in himself until it was given to him by the Father. Evidences are abundant all around us that man has no life in himself, that he is dependent for his existence, as we have said, upon the food he eats, the water he drinks, and the air he breathes. And yet, this is not all, that li all the life that animates men and animals. The spirit of the mundane is the life of all creatures. We have seen in former chapters that the planet Earth was created by a word, that all is spirit, mind. This being so, all there is of man comes from the creative word, active in the Earth. Each world is a separate thought of God. A man thinks of his office, then of his farm, and each is separate from the other. And so it is with God's thoughts in the creation of the worlds. In the thought of creating the planet Earth and man upon it, was the potentiality to make a world make itself, the potentiality of all creative law, so that when we speak of the spirit of the mundane, we refer to this one definite thought of the creative mind, which involves the process of bringing man out from the invisible and passing, through, passing him through all the experiences of an earthly life, generation, labor, sorrow, and death. The fact that the Holy Spirit is separate from the earth is set forth in the teachings of the scriptures. Man is there spoken of as having being separated from God, as being purely of the earth, earthy, of the spirit of the mundane, the creative spirit. It is there shown that he must be redeemed from the power of the mundane. In order to have any life in himself, he must be made partaker of the Holy Spirit, the spirit that is above all. See John 3.31. From these conclusions, it may be inferred that there is no immortality in man's existence. This is both true and untrue, for we read, I know that what God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that man should fear before him. There is no immortality in your existence here, and you should not even strive for that. You should be taking good care of yourself. You should be attempting to keep yourself in good health. Exercise, eat right, refrain from uh, the excesses that lead to degradation of the body. But you should not be seeking to become immortal. You should not be seeking to artificially extend your life beyond what God has allotted. He has accounted for you taking care of yourself. That is part of it. Pharmaceuticals, regulating things that you should be regulating naturally, are more often than not the wrong way to go. It is brought about through fear. Right? It is really easy to have heart surgery and take cholesterol medicines easier than disciplining yourself to the point where you don't need either one of those things. As God created man, therefore, man exists forever, and the very earth that he lives on, the very spirit of the mundane from which his thoughts are derived, is of God, is of spirit. 
It is one thought of the infinite mind to create this world and man in his likeness. This thought of creating the world, the mundane, is separate from all the other thoughts of the infinite, in the same way that one of our thoughts is separate from all other thoughts, or is devoted to a specific object. It is a well-known fact that when a man's mind is centered and he works on one idea at a time, he is more efficient than when he tries to grasp too much at once, for then he accomplishes little. The same is true in regards to this earthly sphere. In order that man may go on developing and fulfilling the object for which he was created, he is limited to his surroundings and to his earthly needs, and he must necessarily be limited and bound to this existence until he has finished growing and unfolding and has reached the condition where he feels the need of a higher life, a superior consciousness. We have seen that reincarnation is a law, that the real man, the soul which is made up of the memories of a lifetime, survives the body and returns by reincarnating until it is sufficiently mature to recognize God, its father. I do believe in reincarnation. I do believe that there are lessons to be learned. I believe that they are progressively harder. But the terminology here gives me a little bit of reticence, right? Uh, survives the body and returns by reincarnating until it is sufficiently mature to recognize God. I don't believe that is necessarily the correct phrasing for that, right? You are here to learn things, and part of that is to find God, but that is available in each incarnation, regardless of spiritual progression. So you could be the very first incarnation of yourself and find God, right? You don't have to be reincarnated to find God. You can find God, live according to what you are supposed to do, and still reincarnate. So it is not necessarily exactly as described here. I do believe in reincarnation, right? I do believe that the soul is eternal, that it was somewheres prior, and it will be somewheres after, and that is part of the reincarnation process, that there are lessons that you agree to learn in this voluntary existence, and that if you don't learn them, they are repeated with a little bit of extra emphasis added on so that you can learn those things. And part of that is finding God. So, yes, but it is also a little bit separate, too. <clears throat> Here seems to be a direct contradiction. Man dies and the memory body is reincarnated, and yet man does not remember his former life. That the memory body does not die, however, but is reincarnated and persists in man, has been brought to light by the hypnotist. For a very illiterate person is frequently found, when under hypnotic influence, to be highly educated. I do not doubt this whatsoever. The interior individual has had a superior education, for he is able to speak different languages and to converse in the most perfect diction. But when the hypnotic spell is removed, the consciousness returns to the same illiteracy. Part of this is absolutely you tapping into your other incarnation. Part of it is tapping into the Akashic Records, right? That is a common terminology used to describe the overarching knowledge of man that you do have access to. You mostly get access to it through prayer, fasting, and meditation, and you are able to extract vital information from it. I believe that creative efforts mostly come from this area. Most of our scientific uh, achievements, the great leaps forward, those came from there as well. But some of the more negative connotations come from there as well, the great leap forward being one of them. <laughs> so there is... A record of all things that happens. It is an energetic distribution of things, right? When you learn something, it changes your magnetics, and that is recorded in the record. When you pass, you are re reunited with God, and therefore, all that information is automatically exchanged. God's picking it up all the way on the way, but you get access to it there. When you come back here, you don't, because part of being here. Is learning lessons, and if you knew all of the things, there would be nothing to learn. The explanation of this is found in the fact of reincarnation. That is, 
There is a memory body latent within the personality which is incapable of uniting with the external consciousness. We have seen that man has no life in himself, and even this memory body has no life in itself, but lives from spirit. It must, however, live from the spirit of its own sphere. That is to say, a stream cannot rise above its source. Neither can the memory body or the physical body do more than act from its own qualities, or from the sphere from which its own qualities have been derived. Now, as all that constitutes the memory body has been derived from the experiences of a material existence in the physical world, it must continue to exist from that world, which means that it must continue to live from and express the spirit of the mundane. And as there is nothing in the spirit of the mundane that has any power to perpetuate the physical structure, therefore there is no immortality in the individual consciousness for man is of the earth, earthy. The work of the spirit of the mundane is unfinished work. It is merely preparatory or preliminary to the ultimate purpose of creation. The earth is a thought expressed for a purpose, and the purpose or trend of the creative activities is to make man in the image of God and in the likeness of God. We have presented man as a creature of the earth, subject to all the vicissitudes of the earthly existence, to all the changes that are constantly taking place on the earth. A creature, subject to all the laws governing an earthly existence, without any capacity at his command to perpetuate himself. He has no life in himself, but is dependent for life upon the planet and upon the spirit of the mundane. He is carried forward by the work of evolution, generation after generation. He has a free will, it is true. He is free to act his real nature. He can, get, he can get the will to do nothing more, nothing less. So is every animal free, but every creature must act in accordance with its nature. It is accepted by many psychologists that man cannot even think that which is not in himself. He cannot think a thought, the qualities of which are not within. Jesus often expressed the same thought. He that is of God heareth God's words, yet therefore hear them not, because ye are not God, not of God. And again, but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Here Jesus seemed to carry out the idea that they were of the earth, earthy, and could think only the thoughts of earth. Again, he said to Nicodemus, If I had told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? The earthly things of which Christ was speaking were in relation to the rebirth of being born from above. For he said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Having viewed man as of the earth, earthy, we come now to a consideration of how is man brought into the divine likeness? That man has nothing directly to do with being begotten from above is clearly brought out in the last text quoted. We merely recognize that the wind blows. We know not why it blows and where it comes from or where it goes. When man, through growth and development, has reached the point where he is capable of receiving a higher influx from the spirit, the spirit flows into him as naturally as the flower gathers to itself the added qualities that make up the blossom, or as the fruit tree gathers the qualities that make the luscious fruit, perhaps through an unsavory quality of sap that nourishes the tree. This, in vegetable life, is a manifestation of that wondrous law of being begotten from above. A wonderful metamorphosis takes place in the tree when, after it has grown year after year and has reached maturity, it puts forth beautiful blossoms, a thing never known of it before. The blossoms drop their petals and the fruit appears, which finally ripens and becomes pleasant to the eye and to the taste, and is good for food. So man has been growing, generation after generation, throughout the cycles of the world's existence, until now isolated individuals put forth the blossom of spiritual desire, a blossom which is by virtue of the inflowing of an added quality, 
a quality that did not exist in man before. What did Jesus mean by declaring, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have not life in yourself? A question he partially answers by saying, The words that I have spoken unto you are spirit and are life. As much as to say, That is what I am talking about, not the flesh, not the blood, but the spirit. For the flesh profiteth nothing. Here the mystery deepens. What does not man become a, why does not man become a partaker of the Holy Spirit long before he does? Is it because the Spirit is not present? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, fills all things, all space. There is no space in the whole universe that is not filled with the Holy Spirit. And but we cannot touch spirit. <laughs> to spirit man is but a shadow. That's not true. You can touch spirit. You can manipulate it. We talk about that often. That which is in a lower sphere is always but a shadow to that which is in a higher sphere. Oh, the answer to that question he was asking is free will, by the way. That, that is why you're not born automatically knowing. is because you are meant to decide. Therefore, though the higher is all-pervading, it can never touch the lower except through intermediaries. Like can touch like only. And the consciousness can be conscious only of that which is like itself. As we move about, the spirit passes through us as if we were not, and there is nothing in man to give him even a consciousness of the existence of spirit. Consequently, some of the brightest minds of the day are denying the existence of God and spirit and of everything beyond their own conscious life. Because of this law that like can touch like only, it was necessary that God should send to earth one of one who had gained the right to be called Yahweh Elohim. One of the masters that had passed beyond the need of a physical body to take on the flesh of a man. This is self-insertion. Paul said when he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Having been clothed upon with flesh and but being a master in this real essence and substance. He knew God. Spirit. He knew the Holy Spirit from past experience. He was begotten of that Holy Spirit. He was a son of God, and God's Spirit was the substance of his being. He was able, therefore, absolutely to control the physical body, to inspire the spirit of his Father, the Holy Spirit, and passing it through the brain organs, he clothed the spirit with the substance of the physical mind. In order to make the Spirit of God accessible to the vital currents and mentality of man, it became essential that a spiritual being clothe himself with a body of flesh, and by the power of the Spirit within him, transmute the flesh and fit it to become the clothing of the spiritual germ. As a seed clothes the vital germ and fits it to be planted in the earth, so Christ fitted the spiritual substance to be planted in his people. Men could never have known the things of God unless there had been such a mediator. Wrong. <laughs> such a nature to stand immediately between spirit, God, and the brain power of the race so the man should be enabled to partake of the things of God and to materialize them, so to speak, into his fleshly substance, thus giving them clothing like those things that the human mind is accustomed to handling. You do not need a mediator between you and God at any point for anything. And most especially not me, but not Jesus either. Certain experiences in modern life suggest this law. For instance, a person who is spiritually minded falls asleep and during the sleep state he dreams concerning spiritual things. The dream interests him intensely and it is so clear and so well defined that when he awakens, he thinks he shall be able to recall it all to mind but he finds that he cannot recall any of the particulars. The powers of recollection cannot touch them. He feels the influence of the dream and seems to have drawn in a certain substance, but yet the mind cannot touch it. What does this mean? <clears throat> it means, simply, that the soul consciousness has become almost, but not quite, able to control the physical consciousness. When the physical is dormant, the soul can think from the soul world, but when the physical comes into activity, the qualities of the substance of which the thoughts are formed are too subtle for the action of the brain. 
and therefore they cannot be called into the brain. They cannot obey the call of the desire mind. Jesus came a member of that world of immortality, a world where the inhabitants live from the substance of the spirit. And he took on him the seed of Abraham. He lived in that fleshly body. He thought in it, controlled it, and thus qualitated it by the power of the spirit. He made for that spirit a covering of the transmuted substance of flesh and blood, thus clothing the spirit of God, making it a seed. We plant a kernel of wheat, composed apparently of very material substance. It springs forth and grows. The material substance dies and disintegrates. But the life that is in it, that subtle, invisible, intangible something, gathers to itself like qualities and makes for itself a new body. So the Christ came that he might take on the flesh of the blood of man and create a seed whose substance was spirit. This seed was planted in his people on the day of Pentecost, and like the kernel of wheat, see John 12, 24, it grew, matured, and multiplied, and will continue to grow until the fullness of time comes, when the harvest of the world is gathered in, the harvest of the first planting of Christ, the seed man. That seed was planted in Egypt well before Moses ever got there. Thus, Christ generated in the world through the unity of flesh and spirit and flesh, a quality that did not exist therein until his time, untrue. A superior quality belonging to a plane next beyond the plane of creative life or the spirit of the mundane. As the prophet said of him, he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days and the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. Isaiah I don't know what L is. I gotta look that up. The force of the prophet's words, he shall see his seed, was strengthened when he said, More are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says Yahweh. For ultimately more will be the seed of the Christ life, the union of spirit which matter took place in his body, by which sons and daughters of God are born, than the spirit of generation. Again, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which was begotten in the Christ was spirit, clothed with the substance of flesh. That is self-insertion. This subtle element of the thought qualities of the Christ, planted in the race, in the lives of men and women, being a quality purer, higher, holier, and therefore more potential than had before existed in the race, made the spiritual potency of man more tenacious. Through this potency and through this only can immortality be attained. Through it and through it only can mind be formed in man that he will be able to know spirit and at the same time to know the things of the earth. Though it, through it, man, recognizing the Father, will unite with the Spirit of God and become Emmanuel, God with us, or God in us, God manifest in the flesh the likeness of God. And this relies again upon a misinterpretation of the words of Isaiah, right? Emmanuel was talking about a specific person who fulfilled a specific purpose and it was accomplished. Footnotes. We know that the thoughts that we think partake of the qualities of the body because thinking exhausts the body. The next section will be the likeness of God, three steps, and that will probably be interesting. Okay, so what did we learn here? The zodiac is not a determinant of your life. Hopefully you picked that up. There is no need for an inter intermediary between you and God. You are able to go to him directly and find the things of the spirit. I have done so. You are able to attain the ability to become empathic, not just having empathy, but being empathic. That is a physical thing. Right? It is the recognition of intuition in large part, but also the ability to do things with that. Right? It does no good to be able to recognize something and not be able to do anything with it. There are people out there who talk about uh, cleansing energies and uh, things of that nature, and I do that. I do. I take, I heal people through that. Right? I have, just by hugging people, 
been able to bring them peace and comfort. Not everybody can do that with a hug. It is not possible. I consciously, when I am hugging in an empathic situation, am taking that energy. And I am transmuting it into the light of God and giving it back. And it is something that they can feel. People will tell you that I, my hug is a little bit different than other people's. Because that is what I am doing. When you need that, I can do that. And I do it consciously. Most of the time I get consent, not all of the time. Because sometimes it is a little bit too much for people to understand. You should not attempt to manipulate anyone else's energy without consent. Unless you understand fully the eight laws of creation and are living in accordance with the eight laws of creation because the eight laws of creation are the foundational laws that govern this stuff. It is how it is done. It is the rules governing how it is done. It's not really how it is done. You are doing that through force of will, right? You do have powers. You don't have to believe that, but it is true. Your intuition is one of them. The ability to love someone else is another one of them. The ability to not love someone is also one of them. You are able to do powerful things. That is real. The Akashic Records are real. I can tap into them and it scares the crap out of me. Right? I am, I am delving. I am starting a new journey of delving. That's why we're doing less content these days. I am, I am preparing myself to spend more time in the spiritual because if I'm going to be doing these things I need to make sure that I am doing the things in the proper manner and so there will be less content I'm going to try and still keep a couple hours a day going but there will be less hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a series of somewhat difficult topics I understand that I have some unconventional beliefs and I have a tendency to step on toes when I relay those beliefs it is not intentional, but it is not something I apologize for. I am here to empower you with the power of God, right? I'm not giving you the power. It's already there. It's already available. You have to take the steps. You have to have the dedication. You have to do the prayer, the fasting, and the meditation. You have to make the steps. I cannot give you the steps. Well, I can't make you take the steps. I can give them to you. I give them to you all the time. Spend the time. Learn. You can do this. You can manipulate the electromagnetic energies of creation. Do so in accordance with the eight laws. There are consequences for doing these things in the wrong order. The infinite integration playlist is a good place to start. It's not the only way to go. There are other people who can get you there, I am sure. The toolbox that I am giving allows you to find these things. It is done in a specific order for a specific reason, so that you don't hurt yourself. It's not so that I get views. I love the views. Don't get me wrong. I love the monetization. I don't manifest money. I'm not manifesting anything outside of God's will. That is my direct intention. I do energetic cleansing. I use tools to do it. I have a grounding stone right here, and then I have another grounding stone right here, and then I have some focus stones. I have a whole shelf full of them back here. I've got a whole tray of them over there. The tools hold no powers. They do nothing without you. They are focus. They are loci foci. They allow you to concentrate energies in a way that you can do. If you like what I'm doing over here, let me know down below. Give me a like, share, and a sub. Throw me a comment. If you agree or disagree, if it remains respectful, it gets to remain up. And if you really like what I'm doing over here, hit me with that super thanks because I do not manifest money to the crew. Thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me and I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt State. Peace.